now that we know about a general chord, I want to look at, think about two particular chords, two special chords. Which you've actually met before on the parabola. Okay? Um, in an ellipse, this is any chord we like. Okay? So for example, let's just draw a quick sketch. So a chord is joining any two points on the ellipse. Okay. But if you think about this guy here, S, right? And I'm not going to draw him in because it would just cloud the diagram a little bit. Um, I've got another focus, obviously S dash. Okay. All of the chords that pass through S, like this guy and this guy and that guy and all of his cousins, right? Because they are chords and they pass through the focus, we call them focal chords. Focal chords. We met this on the parabola, right? So firstly, let me look at the focal chord. Now, I'm not even going to bother with the algebra of this, honestly, because, like I said again before, you can't quote it. And in most cases, you won't have to do it in this general form. You'll actually get numbers for all of this, right? All we want to remember is a focal chord is going to pass through. Now, what are the coordinates of the focus again? In, in terms of the um, proportions and the eccentricity, it's just going to be AE, comma, zero, right? So there's the first one. Um, or it's going to pass through S dash, which is negative A, comma, zero, okay? Now, you may recall, and I'm not going to prove it. In fact, the part of the reason why it's going to have this, bless you, a question in the exercise. Uh, one of the handy things about this is, number one, the reflective properties that we know about focal chords. Um, if you have a look at this, for example, any one of these is going to reflect across and it will hit the other focus. That's kind of nice. The other important detail is all of the tangents you get from those points of intersection and so on, they're not just random, they're all, that's, that's a bad example. They're all going to land on the directrix. You may again remember from proving that result from the parabola. Okay? Um, every tangent that you draw from the end of a focal chord, every pair of those is going to intersect on the directrix. Okay? Uh, and that's fairly easy to establish if you just go through the algebra. So that's the focal chord. You need to remember it because they will say the chord is, is focal and so therefore what you can conclude about it. And secondly, I wonder if you remember, I wonder if this is enough to judge memory, there's one more special chord that we talk about that you remember from the parallel. Mm. Yeah, chord like the chord of contact, very good. So the chord of contact. <coughs> How do we define the chord of contact? What's the, what is it, why, what's the contact talking about when it says chord of contact? Yeah, yeah, good. In fact, I've kind of drawn it over here. Uh, did you notice? Uh, if you get some kind of external point, let's, let's give another one. Here's an external point. Okay. Every external point is going to have two tangents to the ellipse, right? Two tangents to the ellipse. So there will be one that has a sharper angle, like that, and it will intersect once. And then you'll have another one, kind of off at a, a bit of a shallower angle. Okay? So now you've got, from an external point, you've got two points of contact that your two tangents have. And of course, what joins those points of contact is the chord of contact, okay? So just jot down a, a reminder, right? That the chord of contact is the chord formed between, this is where the, the, phrase, the name comes from, it's formed between the points of contact from tangents from an extended point. Now, this one, it will be very easy to actually write down the equation of because I want to remind you of a really fancy piece of geometry that we um, showed dynamically on the parabola, right? Do you remember what happened as I took this external point, right? And if I brought it closer and closer and closer to the ellipse, right? As this point gets closer and closer to the ellipse, what happens to the two points of contact? They get closer. That's exactly right. So for example, if I put a point like there, an external point, Obviously, the points of contact are going to be pretty much one and two, right in the same neighborhood, right? And as I get very, very close to the ellipse, 
these two points of contact are going to get closer and closer and closer. So this, which if I extended it both ways, it sort of blows through the ellipse, so we would call it A, starts with an S, we would call it a secant, right? That secant gets closer and closer and closer to becoming a tangent, tangent right? Which is why <coughs> when we developed this formula, we eventually found out, wait a second, the equation of the chord of contact is identical to the equation of a tangent at a given point. It's just the only difference is you either have a point that's off the ellipse or a point that's on. Okay? Does anyone remember what the Cartesian equation for a tangent is? It's very simple. It's very much like the equation of an ellipse. X, this, X1. Yeah, very good. So I usually have x squared. That's, that's my equation of the ellipse. So for the tangent, I have x, x1. But as a convention, if I'm referring to a point that's off of the locus, I don't call it x1, I call it x0, right? So I've got x, x0 on a square plus y, y0 on b squared equals 1. Okay? So that, being the same as the equation of the tangent to an ellipse, ends up being exactly the same. And there's no need to go through all the things, because again, you can't quote this, you have to go through those steps anyway. So it's not like we can prove this result and then, hooray, we can quote it from now on. Um, you have to do this from scratch every time, and it is easier with numbers anyway. 